Thank you. My name is Melinda Thielbar. I work for Fidelity Investments, but I am um, speaking as Melinda Thielbar, private citizen. And today we're going to talk about open source tools for AI bias detection and mitigation. Um, it's traditional to start these talks by discussing your own biases. I'm a PhD statistician and a labor economist. And what that means is I have some very strong fact-based opinions about how people should be treated both as consumers and as employees in our economy. Um, I'm also a software developer. That means I have some insights into how to build software systems and the purpose of them. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I grew up on a farm in the Midwest. Now, what that, now the traditional kind of vision of people who care about AI ethics and AI bias is this kind of urban, liberal, um, Ivy League sort of person, I guarantee you that was not how I was raised and that is not the world I come from. But I am also an artist. And one of the things that you learn in art is this idea of precognition. It's what your brain decides. These are decisions your brain makes before you're even aware that you're thinking about what you're seeing. And so when I do talks like these, I'm five foot tall, I have giant blue eyes. And sometimes I really feel like what people are seeing instead of the picture you had before, it's more like this, right? Um, and I've, I've dealt with that all my life and that does color my judgment just a tiny, tiny bit. Okay, what's our purpose today? I wanna to get you started on your AI ethics journey. We're going to talk a little bit about bias detection as a concept. We're going to give some examples of some bias detection tools. And what you should leave with is an idea of where you wanna start depending on where you are kind of within your artificial intelligence um, journey as a business or an organization. And then we'll talk a little bit about just AI ethics in general. Okay. Um, software is a tool. It's, um, it's no more useful as a tool than a hammer is useful if you don't have any wood or nails or don't know how to swing a hammer. Um, my basic recommendations are, you're gonna look at three tools today, audit AI, gives you straightforward tests with minimum code. AIF 360 is this comprehensive toolkit that's really meant to be stood up in a production setting um, when you're trying to automatically audit a lot of models and automatically debias a lot of models. The what if tool from Google, which is the last one we'll discuss, is an interactive tool. It's really neat. It's got a lot of wonderful features you can use it with any model you have. It's made to work with TensorFlow. It's easiest with TensorFlow, um, but you can use it with just about anything, but it's an interactive tool. It's not meant to be stood up in a production environment and used as kind of a production test or an automated testing tool. Now let's talk a little bit about bias. So the word bias, um, a lot of people wishes, wish, a lot of people wish that we had chosen another term when we started talking about biased models. Um, bias is a time honored word in machine learning. And all it means is that two groups have different means or two groups have different counts. That's what it means in machine learning. When you apply the word bias to AI, however, when you say a model is biased, you're saying that the model has systematic and repeatable errors that create unfair outcomes. Now think about that. We're talking specifically about cases where bias is an error, um, where it assigns people to a category, not based on the things you're interested in, but based on how they look, um, where they live, information that actually technically isn't relevant to what you're trying to predict. And if you think about model bias in that way, a biased model is not doing what you want it to do. It causes you to miss opportunities. If it's a marketing model, you're showing products to people who aren't interested and you're not showing products to people who are. Furthermore, if people discover that your model is biased and Probably the reason some of you have come to this talk today is because you've seen articles in the news where people have talked about biased models um, and it's been a big reputational hit to a business. If people realize your model's biased, that's a reputational risk to your company. Um, and that is a risk, that's a problem. And so 
if you leave with nothing else today, biased AI models are bad for your business. If you're spending the money on an AI platform, it's worth your time and effort to think about how those models might be biased and what you can do to find out. All right. Um, I am a PhD statistician for those of you who like math. This is for you. Um, for those of you who don't, I promise this is the only equation. Okay. So where does bias come from? This is what I think is the most common concept of bias. You have what you're trying to predict. That's your Y. You have your features. That's your X. And then you have a relationship between your features and your Y. Okay, and this is kind of the true relationship. But when you get to the actual assignment, when you actually start to assign the value of Y, there's this bias that comes in. Okay. And it could be human bias. It could be unconscious bias when people are labeling your training data. It could be systematic bias, like things like people who look like this don't shop in our stores. Well, your stores aren't near any of the neighborhoods where those folks live. And so it could be a systematic bias. And what happens if the bias is large is that instead of learning this relationship, f of x comma b equals y, your artificial intelligence model learns how to distinguish between the people who are being biased against and the people who are not. And so in the worst case of this, you get this model that doesn't, again, actually predict what you want it to predict. It predicts something else. And that is why bias is worth dealing with. And that's why we're interested in detecting it. Okay. So we're actually going to use simulated data um, from an experiment. The example um, is healthcare costs. This is based on a real model. And the intent of this model was, was a good intent. They said, okay, look, we're a medical insurance company. People who are sicker cost more so if we have people who are predicted to be high cost, right? So I've got this cost idea, people who are out on the tails, the high tail for cost. If you're predicted to be in that tail, I am going to assign you to a program designed to improve your health. But what's happening is the protected group has worse health outcomes, right? They're sicker but they're also lower cost and they're lower cost because they're not getting the care they need when they need it. Or they're, they're lower cost because they're not getting the care they need. Not getting the care they need makes them sicker. So it's actually a reverse causality situation. Um, this really happened. There's a, a link in the deck. Um, and we're gonna talk about both how to detect this and we're going to talk about how to mitigate it in real life. Okay. So what does bias testing accomplish? The main purpose of a bias test is to inspect the model and see if it's predicting as well for the protected group and the non-protected group. And who's in the protected group depends on your application. So the classic protected cases are race, gender, and age. Those are the ones you hear about all the time. There could be others depending on where you're located in the world. There could be others depending on your particular business case. But what a lot of these do then is they take something like the true positive rate or the false positive rate and they compare them for the protected group and the non-protected group. And people with degrees in math have figured out what values for those comparisons mean that you have a biased model. Now I've spent a lot of time looking at these, um, a lot of time kind of following the math of other people who've worked on this stuff. And what I've come to realize is that there's a statistic called disparate impact, which is literally just the percent of people in the protected group who are um, assigned to the outcome divided by the percent of people in the non-protected group who are assigned to the positive case. And when I first heard that, I was like, ah, oh, that's not very scientific. This is by far right now my favorite statistic. All right, disparate impact is um, it's unaffected by biases in your target because it only looks at the outcomes from your model. Um, it is for a lot of hiring and lending, it is the legal standard. And it actually has this really nice, really satisfying distribution so that you can look at your sample sizes and kind of make decisions about whether disparate impact is 
is working the way you expect it to work. It's a very solid test. So my recommendation is to always use disparate impact. You're gonna want some other bias tests as well, all right, to kind of get, a, get your arms around what your um, particular model is doing. Pick the negative outcome and choose your bias tests accordingly, right? So if falsely assigning people to the negative case is really, really bad, use the bias tests that focus on the false negative rate. Um, if accidentally assigning people to the positive case is really, really bad, then take a look at the tests, focus on the tests that have the false positive rate. If you're just worried about predicting accurately, so again, the marketing model is the one that I tend to think about. We do a lot of marketing models in our business. Um, if you've got a marketing model, you probably really just wanna make sure that you're accurate everywhere. And in that case, things like average odds, generalized entropy, Thiel index, those are cases where you have the, those are cases where they're looking at the overall predictive accuracy and that's where you wanna focus. Um, if you've never heard the words false negative rate and false positive rate, this slide is for you. Um, so you're true, you have some sort of truth in your data set, right? That's how you're able to train it. Um, and that's either positive or negative. So for our healthcare example, positive is being assigned to this special program, negative is being kind of left on your own and we hope you stay healthy. Um, so you have people who are truly high cost, they're in the positive case. There, and then you have your prediction from your model. And so the predicted label, again, prediction says, we predict you should be positive, you should be assigned to this program, or we predict you are in the negative case, you shouldn't be assigned to this program. If you're right, that's a true, if you predict someone to be in the positive case and they are, that's a true positive. If you predict someone to be in the negative case uh, or in the positive case and they shouldn't be, that's a false positive. Um, and these words start to mean kind of what you think they mean, right? I said they were negative, but they should have been positive. They're in the false, they're a false negative. I said they're negative and they're negative. That's a true negative, right? Um, so again, if you think of our healthcare model, being assigned into this negative category, being denied um, the special program to improve your health incorrectly, all right, that's a, that's a bad outcome, all right? And we probably wanna check the false negative rate um, there's a famous example, and now I guess you could call it a classic example of a model that predicted who was at high risk to reoffend. Um, so it was used for people who were up for parole, and you were assigned parole based on your risk according to this model. All right, that's a case where we really want to check the false positive rate, and we want to be sure that we're not falsely assigning people to high risk categories. In other words, denying them parole based on a model that doesn't predict accurately for them. So this is a conversation that you have with your modeling team and the people who are going to use the outcome of the model. Which of these is the worst? We're gonna focus on those tests and we're always gonna look at disparate impact. That's my recommendation. Okay, now I'm gonna demonstrate these three tools for bias testing. Um, I put this slide in because I kind of want to give you an idea of the lift required for each of these. Again, AIF 360 is extraordinarily customizable. It's really good if you're standing it up in production, you're testing a bunch of models. But if you just need a yes or no on a specific model, it is kind of a heavy lift. Um, on the other hand, Audit AI, there's a couple of packages. It gives you a graph and that's all it does. So there's not a ton of features but it does do what it does extremely well and very simply. And then the what if tool is interactive. It does take some setup, it's a little easier in TensorFlow, obviously, but it's still, it's not, it's not hard, it's not that bad. All right, so let's take a look. Okay, so you should be seeing my Jupyter notebook at this point. All right, and what I'd like you to assume with me is that I've already built this model. So I've built a model to predict cost. So this is my truth here, this is cost, based on your health. So this is a simple little linear regression. Like I said, it's a toy example. I'm gonna use your health to predict how much you're gonna cost 
and I've got a prediction. This is my, this is my validation data set that is sitting over here in this first column. I also have this column called membership and membership tells me whether or not you're in the predicted group. Okay. So I have your predicted cost based on your predicted cost. I'm going to assign you either to the category where you get this special program or not. Okay. That's my prediction. And then I have the truth. I, and the truth is, um, anybody who was actually in the high cost group and high cost for this is upper 90th percentile. So if you were one of the costliest people, that's your true label. And then I have your predicted label based on the prediction from the model. Okay. All right. So you can see me kind of, kind of playing with the data, taking a look at it. All right. These are my, this is my test output. And then I'm going to run audit AI. Um, Audit AI is a fairly straightforward install. Um, it installed with, with no problems on my machine. Um, it should work that way for yours as well. Pip install, Audit AI, wait for a minute and I was done. Um, I'm importing this one little function, bias test check. And what it wants to know is, okay, where's your, where's your membership? Where's your protected group? All right. What's your prediction? Okay, what's, what's your predicted label? Um, and what do you want me to call it? Okay. And when I run, it produces this small report. It says, okay, well, you're, you're failing the four fifths rule. That's disparate impact. Um, you're failing my Fisher exact chi squared and Z tests for equality of proportions. And you're also failing according to the Bayes factor. Um, so it's a straight thumbs up and thumbs down. Now I built this model to be biased, so I am not shocked by this, right? But if you see that run a test on your audit program, that's, that's a really good indicator that you need to take a deeper look and see what you're doing. Okay. Um, these Fisher's exact chi-squared Z tests and Bayes factor, these are actually all just what is the difference in the assignment for people in the protected group versus people in the not. So it's not even looking at model accuracy. It's literally straight up looking at, it's basically disparate impact tested four different ways. These statistical tests um, are based on um, p-values. Um, you've, maybe you've heard of the great p-value controversy in statistics. I try to stay out of the great statistician wars, um, but if you, are from that tradition that lights statistical tests, and I'm of that tradition. This is really, really nice. Is it is it true or not? Are they are they the same? The answer is no. Okay, now we know to take a deeper look. Um, Audit AI will also give you a visual. So keep in mind that I've got this prediction that comes from my data, and for this example, I arbitrarily said, okay, if you're in the top tenth percentile then I'm going to assign you to this category. However, I could pick any cutoff I want, any cutoff that makes sense for me and my business. And so Audit AI says, well, look, your bias tests are gonna be different for these different thresholds. I'm gonna help you pick a threshold where the categorization is the same. And so if you take a look at this run of this series of, um, pictures that I get um, by using the plot threshold tests, very similar syntax. Okay. The x-axis is always the value of my predicted variable. So in this case, it's the predicted cost. You cost me, we'll say that's $10,000 to $80,000 this year. And I know there are probably people who are higher. Okay. And it says, well, look, base factor should be zero. Um, if you use this four to six, um, again, if you use this four to six cutoff, you're, you're spiking high, so you get big differences according to the Bayes factor. If you are from the tradition that likes p-values instead of Bayes factors, you're pretty safe anywhere kind of in this middle, or I'm sorry, you're pretty safe if your cutoff is less than two or bigger than six. Uh, otherwise, you're getting a distinctly different count by group. 
Okay. And they helpfully print this red line. Below the red line is bad. Above the red line is good. And in mathematical tradition, unless it's the Bayes factor, <laughs> okay. below the red line, above the red line. Okay. So that's AI F3, or that's um, audit AI, very straightforward. Yes, no, here's a cutoff that'll keep you out of trouble. Go on with your day. By contrast, this is AI F360. So I'm importing some very specific, um, some very specific functions here. There are a bunch of them, which again, the software is very full featured. If I want bias tests at all, I've got my data set that has my output, but I have to create an AIF 360 data set. So I'm actually generating this other data structure that has my original data in it, but it also has these little decorators that tell it which column is the label, which column is the protected group, um, and what value is the favorable label. And so that's kind of nice if you're doing a lot of automated tests, you give it the information one more time, one time, and then you can run a bunch of different tests. However, you also have to create this metric orage, which lets you specify unprivileged groups and privileged groups. If you program in Python a lot, this is a, a set of key value pairs, right? This is a dictionary. And this is the name of the variable and the unprivileged group for that variable. And you can have as many of these as you want. So if you have to generate a lot of tests on a lot of different groups, this is really convenient because they're all kind of tucked into this one function. Or you can create multiple metrics. And again, they're all tucked into one convenient function. And so that's why I say this is really good for a production environment or where you're testing a lot of models or you have these really strict rules about what you need to test and what you, what you must test and what you don't have to test. Okay, so I create this metric that again gives it information on who's the privileged and unprivileged groups. I create an explainer object based on the metric. And then to get my disparate impact statistic, I run the disparate impact method on the explainer. One of the things I really love about this though is that for every statistic it generates, I get a little explanation. This is, this is the statistic you asked for, this is what it does. And so if I'm printing this out for a user who maybe isn't an AI expert, right? Or isn't an expert in AI bias, they've got a reminder of what that means, of what this specific test does. All right, so this is a, this is a little bit more um, of AIF 360, where I'm actually testing all of the different, um, I'm actually printing out a bunch of different statistics. So unlike Audit AI, it's got all of them. Um, if you have custom metrics, if you've got a statistics team that has a favored metric that isn't in there, it's pretty easy to add your own. That's also a nice feature you can specify which ones you want. Um, and like, like Audit AI was showing you, your, um, your metrics are going to change, right? So this is based on the decision you make based on the model. The statistics change based on the cutoffs. And one of the ways to mitigate bias is to actually change the cutoff and say, OK, I'm going to move the cutoff somewhere where I don't get a biased decision. And there's a lovely demonstration um, in the AI F360 documentation. And then finally, we come to Wit Widget. And Wit Widget is, is warming its way into my heart as one of my, my favorite statistics or one of my favorite groups. So I'm going to kind of set this back to where it was. Okay. All right. So this is, this is the Wit Widget. Um, I've got, and it's a little interactive um, program that runs in your notebook. So I gave it a data set. I gave it some setup information. And now it's producing graphs for me on the fly and interactive. Each ball in this little graph is a data point. Right now, it's colored by who's in the protected group. 
So I can see that my protected group and my non-protected group are about 50-50. Um, I can change that and I say, well, I tell you what, tell me, tell me who's in my label group. And you can see now, oh, okay, well, about 10%, right? Of your of your group, um, you've got about ten percent people who are labeled to be one in the positive case for your outcome. <clears throat> if I if I don't want to have to do that individually for everyone, it has a really nice um, tab called features where I can see that data set. Right, this is stuff that I do every time I get a data set. Um, and so I end up writing a lot of dot hist functions and a lot of code around um, PyPlot. I love PyPlot as much as anybody else. I, I love Matplotlib, but gosh, it's a speed up to just be able to say, okay, here's all the histograms, here's cost, here's health, here's cost, um, <clears throat> excuse me, here's who's in the protected group and here's who isn't. This is a sparse data set. Do I have a really sparse target? Do I need to worry about maybe upweighting? Um, the number of people in the positive case, I might, okay? And over here on my main tab that they call the data point editor, okay, I'm gonna use health to predict cost. Why don't I take a look at health versus cost? I've colored these little points by the protected group, or I'm sorry, right now they're colored by the label. And you can see, okay, yeah, top 10% of cost is in fact labeled as being in the positive case. Let's see who's in the protected group. Okay, right here, no modeling, no tests required. All of my outliers on the low side of cost and the low side of health are in the protected group. Full stop, right? I don't, I don't need something fancy to see that. Now this, again, is a toy example. And a lot of these relationships are kind of intertwined and tangled up. But I can see a lot of this using this interactive tool. And to me, that's the real power of the WIP widget. You can get your bias tests pretty easily with another kind of software. They have a bias testing um, They have a bias testing tab where you can interrogate an existing model. But where I tend to use this, the heavy lifting on this, <clears throat> pardon me, is in the features and being able to just see the features quickly and look through the relationships interactively. Okay, now how do you set this up? Again, WIP widget was a pretty easy install for me. I do have a TensorFlow install on my machine. Pardon me for one second. There we go. Um, what I did to do my own configuration. So what the WIT widget wants is a configuration builder that gives you the data frame that you're gonna work with and the names of the features. It doesn't take a pandas data frame though. You have to do something a little fancier. So here I have my features data frame I had to grab the values of it and send it to a list. Um, again, if you're used to coding in Python, it's not that hard. It's not bad, but it was, it, it took some time. It took a little bit of energy. Hopefully I've done this once you've seen that it needs to be done and it's a little bit easier for you. Um, all of these open source tools, there's a little bit of fiddling while you figure out how they work. And, but once I hand it the configuration, I just run WIT widget config builder and this little interactive system appears in my, in my um, Jupyter notebook. It's really nice. And if you're working on Google's cloud, it's even nicer. There are a lot more, there are a lot more features and some of the things that are difficult about working with TensorFlow models, like having a hard time seeing why the model predicts the way it predicts, are made easier with this tool. So if TensorFlow is your tool of choice, WIT widget is amazing. If you're using other software, 
and you want something so that you don't have to leave Python, but you can work interactively, Wit Widget is amazing. It's got a lot of wonderful features. <clears throat> okay. And that's the basics of which ones you should use. What do you do if you detect bias? Um, there is a software solution, which is called bias mitigation. Um, IBM has spent a lot of time and money figuring out how to implement a lot of these algorithms for bias mitigation. Um, they have some wonderful tutorials on it. I do not have time for a, a full-fledged um, tutorial on it here, um, but the demonstration is in the notebook and I'm happy to answer questions. If you have some specific questions about bias detection, please put them in the Q&A. But what I have found, and the reason I'm not doing a, a huge presentation on bias mitigation <clears throat> is because this really is a new field for us. And so there's a lot of great thought. There are a lot of interesting algorithms that work in some very specific cases. But when it actually comes to implementation, what I have seen is that detecting the bias is step one and mitigating the bias a lot of times means changing what you're modeling or how you're modeling. Um, so what you're seeing on the screen is an example from the pulse algorithm. And this is an algorithm that is supposed to take a pixelated image and turn it into a face, give you an idea of the face of the person who was actually in that image. They um, didn't test it on the 44th president of the United States, or if they did, they didn't think it was a problem that it didn't work very well. Um, and that particular algorithm, as it was released into the wild, worked very poorly for people of color. Um, if you had dark skin, the algorithm could make some pretty, pretty crazy assumptions about you. Um, now, one of the things that I personally love about what we're about the business we're in is that we can have rational conversations about this. Um, one researcher just started the gradient descent for that algorithm in a different place and got a much better answer. Okay, so it didn't mean they didn't have to do anything crazy with the data. They didn't have to do anything crazy to anything. They just had to try something different to get a better answer. And in a lot of cases, that is, that is what you need to do when you find bias in your model. Because bias in your model a lot of times means you're not you're not modeling what you think you're modeling. For our cost model, and I simulated this data, and when I saw the picture that you see on this screen, I was surprised. Okay, so I set this model up so that um, high cost is correlated with bad health. And then you have this confounding factor, which is um, people of color tend to have lower costs and worse health. When I set my training label, it's exactly what you think it should be, right? It's the people on the upper tail of the cost distribution. This is a histogram of cost that you're looking at. And so, you know, most people are around cost four, cost level four, but you've got some people who are really high cost. Those are the people in the blue. And I'd been playing with this model for about a week before I thought, well, wait a minute, why don't I do a histogram of health for the people who've been labeled to be high cost and see what I see. Now, if you look at this, yes, bad health, right? So this negative on health means that you're unhealthy. Bad health is associated with higher costs. This little blue um, group is shifted compared to the orange group, but they're also more spread out, okay? and they're not, there are some people in that high cost group that are average health, maybe even above average. Okay. Simulated data, I simulated this, and this is what happened. All you had to do in this case was just inspect, right? The sickest people are not the most expensive. And that was the case in the, in the real life model as well. The people who were costing the most weren't necessarily the sickest. And so the model that they created based on health failed twice. It didn't lower costs because it wasn't targeting the high cost people, not really. Um, it didn't, and it didn't, and it was biased, right? Making the high cost people who were healthier even more healthy was not gonna reduce your costs. You needed a different approach. Okay. 
That's what I like about the what if tool. It gives you a lot of visibility into these simple relationships. It, it keeps you from cutting your own foot off, right? And in general, right, software is a tool. AIF 360 is a great tool for production. The what if tool is a nice thumbs up, thumbs down on your model. Um, or I'm sorry, Audit AI is a nice thumbs up, thumbs down on your model. And the what if tool is a great interactive visualization tool. There's nothing to stop you from using all three. But really, what keeps you from running biased models is training your team, training each other, reading up on these case studies, and really understanding the issues. Part of that is because this whole thing is a new field. We don't have all the answers yet. Um, but part of it is also, this is, this is not easy. This is in some ways kind of a complex idea and it really does depend on your business case. It depends on what you're doing with the model and how you're using it to make decisions. These references are, are a great way to get started. Okay, the Montreal AI Ethics Ex Institute, um, Lighthouse 3, which is um, dedicated to education and training. Um, there's a book called Towards a Code of AI Ethics, which is kind of, which explores all of the different pieces of this, including data use. Um, and the Certified Ethical Emerging Technologist Professional Training um, that's available on Coursera. It's taught by a woman named Renee Cummings from, um, from and she's got an amazing background and it's, it's a six course certification process that really helps people learn how to think about these issues and educates you on, um, his, on the historical context of the data we have and how to make good decisions based on the data we have. And as always, I recommend you read the docs. The docs for each of these software algorithms are actually really, really good. They're a great guide. Um, hopefully I've simplified it for you, given you a better idea of where to start. And um, if you have more questions, we have about eight minutes for Q&A, and I would love for you to use the Q&A tab. Um, we can also connect on LinkedIn, and you can find me on GitHub. Thank you very much.